Peter, the slave and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have received the faith in the same kind of ours, by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ, grace and peace be multiplied to you through the full knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, seeing that his divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness, through the full knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and majesty. For by these he has granted to us his precious and great uh, magnificent promises, in order that through them we may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption in the world by us. Now for this very reason also, uh, applying all diligence in your faith, supply moral excellence, in your moral excellence, supply knowledge. In your knowledge, supply self-discipline. In your self-discipline, supply perseverance. In your perseverance, supply godliness. In your godliness, supply brotherly kindness. And in your brotherly kindness, supply love. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they render you neither useless nor unfruitful in the true knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But he who lacks these is blind, having become nearsighted, for he has forgotten, um, forgotten his purification from his former sin. Therefore, brethren, be all the more diligent to make certain of his calling and choosing of you. For as long as you practice these things, you will never stumble. For in this way, your entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, will be abundantly supplied to you. Therefore, I will always be ready to remind you of these things, even though you already know them, and have been established in the truth that is present with you. For I consider it right, as long as I am in this earthly dwelling, to stir you up by way of a reminder, knowing that the... Uh, laying side of my earthly dwelling is eminent, as also our Lord Jesus Christ has made clear to me. And so I will also be diligent, so that any time after my departure, you may be able to recall these things to mind. For we did not follow cleverly devised tales when we made known to you the power and majesty of our Lord Jesus Christ, power and coming, excuse me, and, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For when he received honor and glory from God the Father, such an utterance as this was made to him by the majestic glory. This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. And we ourselves heard this utterance out from heaven when we were with him on the holy mountain. And so we have the prophetic word made more sure, to which you do well to pay attention, as a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your heart. But know this first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation. For no prophecy of Scripture was ever made by the will of man, but men, being moved by the Holy Spirit, spoke from God. But false prophets also arose among the people, just as there will also be false teachers among you, who will secretly introduce destructive heresies, even denying the master who bought them, bringing swift destruction on themselves. And many will follow their sensuality, their sensuality, and because of them, the way of truth will be maligned. And in their greed, they will exploit you with false teaching. Their judgment from long ago is not idle, and their condemnation is not asleep. For if God did not spare the angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell and committed them to pits of darkness reserved for judgment, and if he did not spare the ancient world, but preserved Noah, the, the creature of righteousness, with seven others when he brought the flood upon the world of the ungodly, and condemned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah to destruction by reducing them to ashes, as an example to all who would live ungodly lives thereafter. And if he rescued righteous Lot, oppressed by the sexual conduct of unprincipled men, 
For by what he saw and heard, that righteous man while living among them was tormented day after day in his righteous soul by their godless deeds. Then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from temptation and keep the unrighteous <coughs> under punishment until the day of judgment. But especially those who indulge in the flesh in its corrupt desires and despise authority, daring, self-will, they do not tremble when they revile mag angelic majesties, whereas angels who are greater in power and might do not bring a reviling judgment against them before the Lord. But these, like unreasoning animals, born as creatures of instinct, to be captured and killed, reviling and saying in matters where they have no knowledge, will in the destruction of those creatures also be destroyed, suffering wrong as the wages of doing wrong. They find it a pleasure to revel in the daytime. They are stains and blemishes, reveling in their deceptions as they carouse with you, having eyes full of adultery that never cease from sin, enticing unstable souls, a heart trained in greed, accursed children. Forsaking the right way of life, they have gone astray and have followed the way of Balaam, the son of Baor, who loved the wages of unrighteousness. But he received a rebuke for his transgression. The mute donkey, speaking with the voice of the man, restrained the madness of the prophet. These are springs without water and mist is driven by a storm, for whom the gloom of darkness has been reserved. For while speaking out arrogant words of vanity, they entice with fleshly desires, with sensuality, those who barely escape from the ones who live in corruption, promising to them freedom while they themselves are slaves of depravity. For by what anyone is overcome, by what a man is overcome, by this, he has been enslaved. For if, after having escaped the defilements of the world, by the true knowledge, by the full knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in them and are overcome, the last state has become for them worse than the first. For it would have been better for them had they not known the way of righteousness than having known it to turn away from the holy commandment which was handed down to them. It has happened to them according to the true proverb. The dog returns to his vomit, and the sow after washing returns to the blowing in the mire. Wow. Yes. Wow. Um, as Peter multiplied our advantages, in chapter 1. He has multiplied terror and horror in chapter 2. Just to me, it's just a lot. Okay, so let's pray. Dear Father in Heaven, um, chapter 2 is hard, but I want to thank you for putting it on today. I want to thank you for giving us so much that we cannot walk away and say, Oh, that's not a big deal. Thank you for this huge warning that you are handing to us today. And help us to learn how to use the information, how to um, discern, how to protect ourselves, and uh, to learn to appreciate all the parts of your work, the parts that are enjoyable and fun and uplifting about how much you love us, and the parts that talk about how much you will judge because you are holy. So help us to learn and understand today. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, okay, so uh, it was quite a study this week. And the words are just getting thicker and heavier and applying. And um, so let's get into this. Um, springs without water. The, uh, it is designed to 
show a word picture. But Peter's been giving it to you for all over the place. Just the words he chooses gives us these big word pictures. But here, this one's a really specific word picture. A spring without water is like you're in a desert and you see an oasis and you're thirsty and you go to drink and there's nothing there. Okay, so it's supposed to be really dramatic that there's nothing offered here. So um, I was looking up springs and water and Jude talks about the same thing, so I'm going to flip over to Jude. This is a side note. Peter is writing um, his last letter, and he knows his death is imminent. He's told us that. And he knows that we are coming, that these are two people coming to the end of the first century. And he's laying it on really, really thick, and he gives this huge warning. About 15 years later, Jude is written. And Jude is planning on, you would think, just you would think reading chapter 2, this is good. This is going to do it. This is going to accomplish the job. People are going to take the warning, and this is going to be it, and God's put a stamp on it, and now we know how to identify false teaching, right? So 15 years later, maybe 20 years later, I'm getting this off the top of my head, Jude writes his letter. Jude is a brother of Jesus, he's a brother of James, but he won't call himself the brother of Jesus, he calls himself the brother of James, and uh, there's a humility factor there, and he starts off saying, I got this great thing I want to write to the people, and the Holy Spirit, this is proof of inspiration, stops him, and changes his topic. He said, I started to write this, but then I had to write this, and, and he actually says that, and, then he, and what does he do? He almost, in his own words, repeats chapter 2 of Second Peter. And I thought to myself, we already have chapter 2. <laughs> Why do we need Jude? God must have said, okay, we need Jude too. Yes. So there's two major things. Now, if you read Paul's last letter, is to Second Timothy, to Timothy, it's not crammed full of, of this, but there's this in it. If you read John's last letter, which is Revelation, it's in there too. So these last, and if you read the first, second, and third John, it's in there too. Um, so here at the end of the first century when the Bible's closing out, we get over and over and over again warnings like this. And I mean, what a wonderful thing to finish the thing is how do you protect yourself from lies? How does the church as a whole protect itself? So this, all these descriptions are for this purpose. And, and um, I've always preferred to not read chapter 2 of Second <laughs> Peter. And it's like, that's not the right thing. That's the, I need to read this chapter. I need to know this chapter. And um, I need to understand how, how it works and how people, how deception works. Because if, if you don't know how deception works, you will be deceived. Because that's the whole premise of deception, is to get you by what you don't know and get it in here. So that's, as we're finishing chapter 2 today, I thought, I just hit me that. So Jude says, same kind of thing. Yes, woe to them, they have gone the way of Cain, 
and for they pay uh, and for pay they have rushed headlong into the error of Balaam, and they have perished in the rebellion of Korah. I almost wanted to tell you the story of Korah, but it's a Jude story, not a Second Peter story. <laughs> There's a lot of cool things in the story of Korah. Not that there isn't in Cain too, but you know we all kind of know Cain's story. Not everybody knows Korah's story. So, um, so that has a lot. Proverbs 25, 14 talks about um, waterless things like clouds and wind without rain is a man who boasts of his gifts falsely. So there's that. Uh, Jeremiah talks about broken cisterns. And in that one he says, you guys, God is talking and he's quoting God, and he goes, you guys have rejected me, the springs of water, and gone for broken cisterns. That's Jeremiah's message to the Israelites right before Nebuchadnezzar comes and wipes them out. And that wipeout was uh, serious and not very gracious in the way it happened. And um, it's broken cisterns. They have actually rejected the living waters and gone for broken cisterns. Jesus called himself living water, or said he had living water. He didn't actually call himself living water. Is he correct? Because there isn't an I am living water. I hoped for that. Because <laughs> I wanted there to be one, but there isn't one. Um, he talks about that. He talks about that with the woman at the well and all that. So we have this. Peter's not like just throwing this out there out of the blue. He's got these pictures in mind. Who is the living water? Who is being rejected? What is happening like cisterns? Well, he describes it a spring without water. This is supposed to be a spring that has constantly fresh water coming up. Not like um, a storage, a water storage unit, you know, where you have stagnant water that you just get water and it's clean until you it's not and then you have to go boil it and make it clean. But um, so this is supposed to be continually fresh water. That's what the word implies. So uh, no these people are like, not like that. They don't have fresh water. And they're like mist. Uh, I spelled it in English wrong. It's N-E-P-H-E-L-E. -E. But um, they're a mist. Uh, this is an actually a picture of a picture of California except for yesterday. <laughs> um, the land is in desperate need of water. And sometimes we get these dark clouds that come over that don't actually form clouds. They just become overcast. And we don't get any rain out of them. And there's like this hope for rain, but no rain comes. And you go, oh, it's cloudy, maybe we'll get rain. Now, if it's if, if you live in Oregon, you, you're not asking for rain every day. But if you, if you live in California, you are. Depending on if you're living in eastern Oregon, you are asking for rain every day. But um, So this is about someone who promises information that is going to help supply your spiritual life with water. And there's none left. That's this picture. He's trying to blast us with serious pictures. So, driven by the storm. That storm is not just a little storm. It's a whirlwind. It's a tempestuous storm. It's a squall. It's a hurricane. A big storm. It describes the storms that came in on the Sea of Galilee. The Sea of Galilee is fresh water, but it's below sea level, and it's in this canyon thing. I have never been there. I just read about it. And the winds come in and create like a wind tunnel. Which, that's why the storms on that sea are so incredibly violent. Which is why I think it's so cool that Jesus could just sleep through a month. I mean, <laughs> These guys who are professional fishermen, this is, I'm off topic. These guys who are professional fishermen know how to deal with the storm, and it is so bad, they think they're dying and they're going to tip over. You haven't woken me up, I'm just saying. <laughs> and it didn't wake him up. Uh, there's something so cool about that. <laughs> I thought, if I could sleep through my storms, if I could be calm through my storms of life like that, I would really like that. 
you know, you just chill out and be calm through my storms. I haven't accomplished that yet. <laughs> no, so, uh, for whom the black darkness has been reserved. Um, yeah, that, actually Peter uses the exact same word for us in 1 Peter, but he says that word reserved, but it's for our inheritance reserved. I just thought that was a cool contrast. I love how he's using his words. So he's used that same word in 1 Peter, verse 4. So, um, for while speaking out arrogant words, I wanted to show you the arrogant words. Oh, I forgot to get my pins out. Just a minute, excuse me. I have all these cool pins because you guys are very generous. And I left them all in the back. Right? 
And they come up with these, I've actually read a lot of this work, and they come up with this, and at the very end, your thought is, but it doesn't work, it's not true. You know, so if you were in a big debate with them, you would have all this stuff, these bombastic words of overswollen, and the, at the bottom line is, so how did that first thing happen? If, if like, so even Mo Celia asked me this the other day. She goes, they said that this caused this, but what caused that? And what caused that? And what caused that? Mm -hmm. She goes, and what, what, how do you get that? What was the first cause of that? And I thought, you know, she's, if a 10 year old can figure that out, that's, the rest is bombastic words of arrogance, right? Yeah. It reminds me of which came first to Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, if you read Genesis, the chicken. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> the chicken came first. Yeah. And, they, and the same thing, they were asking me, well, how old everything was. And I thought, and I, um, the kids were asking me this, and I thought, you know, we assume, it's an assumption, that time went on at the same rate now as before, and it always, like, I mean, and that's not necessarily a true assumption. But my other thought was, and I didn't say this to them because I didn't think of it until after they left the house. So <laughs> I will say it next time. So when God created Adam, was he a baby or was he an adult? Because he was an adult. So he created him with age. So if he created Adam with age, could he have created other things that look like they had age? I mean, some stars look like they have age. So whatever, according to what, how we figure stuff. You know, I thought for a kid that would be a really easy explanation of how did they get 20 billion years ago when, you know, on age, God could make something 20 billion years old. Like that, on the age. <coughs> whatever he wants. Anyway, this, you guys are used to me going all over the place. So, okay, so they entice us. With, uh, actually, I copied this from someone because I thought that the words that described these people were also full of um, fancy verbiage, and I thought that was a really good description of them. But it's not that their words lack content. They just lack truth. They are fruitless, ineffective, unproductive. The false teachers have the uncanny ability to clothe the futile, meaningless thought with pseudo-intellectual script of verbiage. <laughs> And I thought, you know, the words that describe them actually are <laughs> you know, this, yeah. And so that is a, that is God telling us one of the methods that they will use to um, deceive us. Hmm. By fleshly desires, and it crossed my mind that fleshly desires are, well, are two ends of the spectrum. One end of the spectrum says, and this is a teaching I've heard that we are saved by grace and grace covers everything and all the sins were paid so it does not matter what you do. Anybody heard that one? Yeah. It does not matter what you do. Live your life however you wish. It's, you're all good. Okay. And that just gives license to anything under the sun. The other side of the spectrum is my fleshly desire is, and I've seen this in people, I want to, in myself, prove to God that I am good enough. <laughs> good luck. Yeah. But that really is a viewpoint out there. And, um, and so that fleshly desire is a self-promoting, over-swollen, and so you see the very legalistic side to the other extreme. So I would have put the Pharisees in this pack, and then there's, of course, the Roman culture and Greek culture in that path, and you have that. And then there's various in between. So I thought, when I first read the fleshly desires, I only went that way. I thought, well, that's not, <clears throat> actually, this way is almost more deceptive because you're under the assumption that you're going to, I've actually had people directly tell me they did not need Jesus Christ because look at how good I am. Whoa. And no matter what I said, I could not break past that. Like, oh my goodness, so that 
person's face comes to mind when I read this, just not, not as in a judgment that I feel bad for them, you know, because that's where they are under this delusion. They are self-deceived in this world. And it will not turn out good for them in the end. And so I, yeah, so that's, I, that's called antinomianism on one side and legalism on the other side. Antinomianism because the word for law is namas, and if you are anti-namas, you are anti the law, which means you are free to do anything you want. That's what antinomianism means. Once I learned what the word meant, I could remember it. Otherwise, I couldn't remember the word for anything. So they barely escape from the ones who live in error. Um, the error is one who takes the wrong path. That's pretty simple. Promising to them freedom. I wanted to show you the word promising. Promising is euakalia. It's the verb form of euakalia. Euakalia is the word uh, for, um, for gospel. It's the good news. So the good news is a promise of good news. So they take the word promising, not that they are promising good news. I mean, it's just the general word. It's just so much like the word for gospel. I thought, oh my goodness, how close. Peter picks a word that is close to the real thing. So, E-U-A-N-G-E-L-I-A. There's angel right there. And this is good. This means to bring a message. And that's just a uh, down ending. Okay? To bring a good message. So they are promising a good message. And that's the word for good news, gospel. I thought, wow, what a, what a word for Peter to choose to show us how much they are promising good news. Promising freedom. That's their good news, freedom. While they themselves are slaves of corruption. Now this is a huge irony. How can someone who is a slave promise freedom to someone else? If you are stuck in the slave market, you're not the one who can buy. Why do you think Jesus had to live his life without sin? Because he had to be outside that slave market or he could not purchase our freedom. So here they are doing it backwards. You see this picture? It's a huge picture that he's painting. Promising to them freedom while they themselves are slaves of corruption. And then, it's very ironic. For by what a man is overcome, to this he is enslaved. Overcome is the word uh, for being defeated in battle. And um, it also means to be uh, less inferior, conquered, to succumb, vanquished, subdued, forced to yield. The defeat is whatever has conquered you as now mastered you. Uh, in the ancient world, if there was a battle, the probably still somewhat today, but not so much. Um, the, the army that comes in and conquers, the people who are conquered, the army that comes in, the com country that comes in has total right to do anything they want to the people they've conquered. They can kill them, they can take them as slaves, they can rape them, they can do anything. There's no such thing as war crimes. They can do anything they want. And at that point, that person who's conquered is theirs for as long as they're allowed to live. So that's what this is the word that was used here. They promise to us freedom while they themselves are conquered by depravity. Uh, trying to conquer us by depravity, and that depravity can be on either spectrum. So don't just think of it on the on the horrible, sinful side of it, but also on I'm so good I don't need Christ on the side of it. 
both sides of the problem. So, so for by what a person is overcome, by this he is enslaved. And that, they would have recognized that. People who are reading this for the first time, but well, duh, whoever conquers you has enslaved you. Now I thought, what a cool thing on the opposite side of the spectrum. What if Jesus has conquered me? What if he has taken me out and conquered me? Then am I not enslaved to him? And is that not a good thing? So uh, I was thinking, so then it dawned on me that I'm not the first person who had that thought. So go look at uh, Romans chapter 6. So it, the whole chapter is about this, but look at verse 16. Do you not know that when you present yourself to slaves for obedience, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either resulting in death or obedience <coughs> resulting in righteousness? Thanks to be to God that though you were slaves of sin, you have become obedient from the heart to that form of teaching to which you are committed. And having been freed from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. Isn't that cool? That whole chapter goes on and on and on. And it ends with, um, but now, having been freed from sin, this is verse 22, and enslaved to God, you derive your benefit, resulting in sanctification. And the outcome, eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. So, so evidently, God was using that. We're going to be slaves to somebody. So pick your master. Right. For verse 20. For if, after they have escaped the defilements of the world, by means of the full knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in them, and are overcome, the last state has become for them worse than the first. So, that's, that's uh, back to Second Peter. Sorry, I jumped back and I didn't tell you. I just liked my brain up there. I thought your brains went there too, so. <laughs> to read my brain. To read my brain, yeah. <laughs> so, um, no, don't go there. That's a scary place. <laughs> I don't even know if I want to go there. So, um, these people have, whoever these false teachers are, have had full knowledge, it says right here, of our Lord and Savior Jesus. And the word full knowledge is epinosis. And earlier in this series, I explained the difference between gnosis and epinosis. Epinosis is a full knowledge. Gnosis is a knowledge. It's a general big package knowledge. Epinosis is a specific full knowledge on a topic. It doesn't mean that you believe. It just means you've got it. You've got this knowledge. And they have this knowledge. So do they know how salvation works? Yes. Do they know that Jesus Christ paid for their sins? Yes. Do they know that they will be judged? Yes. Do they know that they are going to have to stand before God and make an account? Yes. Do they know that they cannot come clean? I mean, they cannot face it. Yes. They have the full knowledge, and yet they reject it. I thought... How do you reject that? And I'm, okay, I said, all right, God, I need, to, I need an example because otherwise I'm... And the, the first one that should have come to mind was Judas, but it didn't. The first one that came to mind were the, uh, was the people of the Sanhedrin. On the day they put Jesus on trial, and Caiaphas actually asked Jesus, are you the Christ? And he says, yes. <coughs> And then they said, okay, that's blasphemy. Now you have to be crucified. So did they have full knowledge? I mean, we don't have all the details of it, but what were they given? A complete true knowledge. And they turned it down. 
Now later, that same group, that same Sanhedrin, uh, Peter stood in front of them. And he told them the same story. And they stood in front of him again. And Peter and John stood in front of him. And he, they told him the same story. And then later, Peter is in jail, and the angel rec uh, rescues him out. And they get the story, secondary issues, but they get it again. So they've had this several times. And they did not, as a matter of fact, one of their own members, the guy who taught Paul, um, Gamaliel, they're standing there and they're going, we need to, the, the Sanhedrin's in conference, and the, the apostles are out there in jail in the holding room for the minute, and they're trying to decide what we're going to do to these guys. And the whole town of Jerusalem is like, oh, Pentecost has happened. It's great. We're having a great time. And the San Pedro is pushing back really, really hard. And they're, it's, it's going to turn into a riot, another riot, right? And so Gamaliel stands up and he says, okay, this is what we should do. If and he gives two examples. He goes, this guy thought he was the Christ and got a bunch of followers, three or four hundred, whatever that was. But when he died, they dispersed. So that, that, that wasn't true, and it just fell apart. We didn't need to do anything. And then, then this other guy, he, got, he thought he was the uh, Messiah. And then when he died, that same thing happened. So he goes, what's going to happen, the same thing's going to happen here if this is the real thing you will find yourselves fighting against God. If it's not the real thing, it will fall apart. Melia, in his own way, just retold all of the full truth to the men of the Sanhedrin. I would not want to watch Caiaphas when he stands before the white town. He was the high priest. He was the one in charge. He was the one that put down the final gavel and said it was the one. He was the one that promoted it in front of Pilate. Even Pilate will be less responsible than Caiaphas. And then, of course, there's Judas. If there was ever a person who had full knowledge, there was Judas. So there's probably more. That's the only two that, I mean, I didn't take a lot of time to research that. But there's probably other people in the Old Testament want that have full knowledge. I'm thinking some of the uh, false prophets at Jeremiah's time would have had full knowledge because they were such antagonistic to um, Jeremiah. Even the king, the king who burned the scroll, you know the story of the king who burned the scroll? The king actually burned the Bible. Yeah, one of the kings in Israel, he's, uh, Jeremiah is writing the book of Jeremiah and he is in prison and there. There's a, you know, there's a poster on the um, post office that says, uh, Jeremiah, if we find him, he's going to be, you know, taken into custody, whatever. So, so Jeremiah is not coming out. But he sends his assistant, um, starts with B. Anyway, he sends his assistant out there, and the assistant takes the scroll, freshly written scroll of Jeremiah, and he stands up at the temple, Baruch. Baruch stands up at the temple and he reads the scroll. Of course, it's not really like a happy scroll for the people of, Jer of that day, and they don't much like it. And one of the uh, temple guys says, "Oh, we got it. We got it. We got. Wait, stop, stop. Let's take you and let's let you present it to the king and let him decide what he wants to do or not." So they gather the king, and I can't remember which one is probably Jehoiakim. Kim. And because uh, there's a Jehoiakim, a Jehoiachin, and a Jehoiach, another one, and I get the Kims and the Chins all mixed up. So. Um, <laughs> anyway, he stands there, and and they're and the group, and they read it to the king, and the king gets so furious, he grabs the scroll, the original, and throws it into the fire. And I thought, that's someone who has full knowledge and turned it down. And, and of course, of course, God, God let, had Jeremiah write it again. Can, can you imagine writing Jeremiah again? And, and he had to write it again, because we still have it. So yes, there are people that have full knowledge who turn it down. 
Maybe Cain was one of those. Maybe Balaam was one of those. Maybe some of our leaders in the government. Maybe some of our. There's probably quite Not a few. Maybe. I think they're part of they the There are several that claim to be uh, Christian that don't give that kind of impression. So, <laughs> what else to say about that? So, yes, there are people who have had full knowledge that turn it down. And um, they've. They've been in their position, they've been in a situation where they've been given to, and they return to being entangled in the mire. That word entangled, just as a side note, is the same, it's a twisty thing. It's the same word they used for making Jesus crown. I can put that in there, just, it doesn't, it, it just, that he wore that twisted crown. So it would be better for them. And you're responsible for what you know. Too much to whom much has been given, much is required. You're responsible for I always thought that meant a different category of stuff. I hadn't thought about it as to who much has been given a lot of information which is required of them. I always thought of it in terms of um, your spiritual gifts and whatnots, and people who bury their spiritual gift in the ground and don't use it, but maybe that applies to that too. But this, this hit me that it also applied to this. So it would have been better for them to not have known the way of righteousness than to have known it to turn away from the Holy Commandment, which was handed down to them. Okay, so it has happened to them according to the true problem dog returns to his vomit, and the sow, after washing, returns to wallowing in the mire. Uh, one guy I read said that Peter has taken these word pictures all through this thing, and he has piled them like this. And he is now taking what he thinks is the epitome of the word picture for a Jewish person, and put it on the top, and said, this is it. Dogs for those of you who love dogs. Dogs back in those days were not dogs like now. Dogs were wild animals that ran in packs and were somewhat ferocious and garbage, rummaged through garbage and were just considered unclean and not good. Like, to, be called a, to call a Gentile a dog was like to call a Jew a pig. You know, that was... That was fighting words, and so uh, to say that these people are dogs, uh, the, the picture is that the dog is uh, getting rid of the corruption on the inside, clean himself out. And now that he's clean on the inside, he goes and eats it again. They do that. Yes. Now the pig, the pig was getting cleaned on the outside. And the outside went and wallowed in the mire again. So the question is, why do dogs do that? And why do pigs do that? And that's because it's their nature. It's because it's their nature. And it dawned on me that it's talking about the sin nature of all of us. We are all dogs and pigs. And we have been born with this nature. And we are filthy on the inside. And we are in our function, filthy on the outside. And we are dogs and pigs until we are born again. And when we are born again, we get a new nature. Not only, we still have the res re residue of the old nature because we still have to fight with that, but we also have a brand new nature. So we don't return to our vomit, and we don't roll in the mire. As a matter of fact, we're not even called dogs and pigs anymore. We're called sheep. We have a new nature. Um, sheep are actually dumber than dogs and pigs. Just thought I'd tell you about sheep. 
I've had a lot of fun studying about sheep, and uh, there's a whole lot of things about sheep. They, uh, they uh, can't find food. They, they, they don't know. Okay, so you got a field, and right over here, it's all dead with briars and bristles, and there's beautiful green grass right here. The sheep is like colorblind. Can't figure out which one it is. Okay, so the sheep has to be taken and fed the good thing. The same with water. The sheep does not know if he should drink out of the mutual cesspool uh, that gets collected when there's a herd of sheep, or should drink over here with the fresh water. And if there is fresh water and it's moving very fast, the sheep is too afraid to drink it. So it has to be a spill water. So the sheep aren't really smart. If um, if if the sheep are out and and they're and they lay down in the beautiful green grass and they let's say they're kind of heavy and fat and they get rolled over, they're stuck on their back. They cannot get up. They sit there with all four paws up, all legs up in the air. Paws? They don't have paws. <laughs> all four hooves with their legs up in the air and just bleed because they can't turn themselves over. And then before long, there's vultures circling overhead because the sheep will die laying on his back. A good, healthy sheep will die laying on his back. And um, that's kind of like us when we uh, have sinned and we need to be forgiven and turned. And the shepherd comes and turns us. And there's that. Sheep get caught. Sheep wander off. Sheep go on long paths. Sheep are scared of uh, everything under the sun. It could be a it could be a mountain lion attacking, or it could be a jackrabbit running by, and the sheep is scared. Sheep don't know if there's flies attacking. The sheep's tail cannot whack the flies. Cannot get stuff off of him. Cannot do anything. He just sits there and the flies. If the flies are there a lot, they crawl up the sheep's nose and get embedded and lay their eggs up their nose. And those eggs turn into worms and crawl up into their brain and eat them from the inside out. Yeah, this is we're sheep. Um, <laughs> that's why the shepherd anoints them with oil because he puts the oil on their faces and on their nose and on their ears and the, sh and the flies will stay off the flies won't then so we need to be anointed with oil um, we can't get our stickers out uh, we can't protect ourselves we fall off cliffs, we get stuck in thorn bushes, we do all these things. But there is one thing that a sheep will do. If a sheep knows he has a good shepherd, he will follow. He will follow. And that's the picture that we are. We are these sheep and we have a good shepherd. And, and I love that, you know? I just love that picture. If the sheep, if the sheep wanders off, the shepherd will leave the 99 and go after the lost sheep. The sheep loves to hear the shepherd call his name. The sheep wants to hear the shepherd's voice. The sheep get scared over anything, so but if the shepherd sings to them in the middle of the night, the sheep are comforted and they can go to sleep and they can lay down and rest. They really need a shepherd. I don't think God picked sheep as us to call a sheep by accident. Sheep is very specific. So um, I'm getting done really early today. <laughs> and I do have a homework thing that's not on here. But I thought uh, that you guys would like, Romans 6 is a great thing to read. It's about who to be enslaved to. But here's the other one. Do a study of sheep. <laughs> I read a book about sheep. I forget Mark had talked about it, but it talked about when they get afraid, if they're pregnant, they lose their baby. That's how. And I was like, oh my, just something simple, like you said, a storm. 
a storm can just they just they miscarry. Yeah. I thought how oh, sad. They're so they live in fear. They live they can live in fear. Yeah. She I forget which book it was. That's Shepherd's Shepherd's God of Twenty. Keller. Yes, that's oh I love it's, that it's one. It's the Shepherd's uh, looks at the Twenty Three Psalms. Yes, yes. Yeah, I have that. I meant to bring it. It's by Philip Keller. Yeah. So and, good. Uh, I have it somewhere. It might be in the library too. It's it's a book written early seventies or late sixties. It's a it's and he compares it to um, uh, not like a current sh sheep farm or right. herd or whatever you call it because they raise sheep differently now. But was it Yancy? Yeah. <coughs> no, oh, no, 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 it's no, Philip Keller. Keller. Mm -hmm. And um, and uh, it, it was an African man who was a shepherd. I think that's the story that he follows and or he was comparing it to and he had his sheep and he took care of in the similar way that they did way back at the time of the Gospels. So what do they do? How does the shepherd get the cool water? How do they deal with the hot summers? How do they take them up on the hills in the summer so they can have the cool summer breezes? How do they bring them back to the sheepfold in the winter so they don't freeze out there? What does the shepherd do to make a, a flowing stream still? And how the shepherd has to build a dam and still it into a pool so that the sheep can get there? Um, the poisonous flowers in the, they love these particular lilies that grow wild and they're poisonous. So the shepherd would go through the whole upper valley and pull the weeds before he let the, shep the sheep into the thing. What's it like to follow the tiny, narrow roads? And why? Um, what happens when there's something in the way? And the sheep are stumbling over what's in the way? It's a, it's a beautiful story of just our daily lives. It's just, but it's all the sheep. It's just the story of the sheep. And you, you see yourself in it all the way through. You see the sheep almost falls over the cliff. You see the sheep. You see the sheep when he's dying. And what does the shepherd do as the sheep dies? I'm giving away the whole book, but um, you'll want to read it. It's a beautiful, beautiful story. It's not that thick. It's only. Yeah. So what's the name of it? Shepherd's Look at the Twenty Three Psalms. I think it's a shepherd. It's called a shepherd looks at the 23rd song. Yeah, at the. I think it's this one. Because when you read that, you're like, oh. So you, I'm just going to share. You can get it on audio if any of you can connect to your car while you're driving. You can listen to it. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a great thing. Joe is about to teach it to our four and five year olds. Oh yeah, so it's a it's a real cool. It's probably what came to mind. So, um, so here's some uh, verses for you to look up uh, and study. And this is not all the shepherd passages in the Bible. There's just some of them. There's um, Psalm 23. You know that one. There's Psalm 100. You know that one. There's uh, Isaiah. 53.6, that's not a very good five. There's uh, John 10. Um, Luke 15, and I don't have the verses, has the story of the lost sheep, but this is the one that you need to really read. Ezekiel 34. Ezekiel 34 does not mention dogs or pigs. It mentions it as false shepherds. But if you take dogs and pigs and just in your mind put it where it says false shepherds, you've got the story of Second Peter and Ezekiel 34. What do that says that? It says that they, uh, they let the ones who need them go are neglected and they eat the ones that are fat. That talks about by greed they will deceive you. And that's that's in Ezekiel 34. I'm not I wouldn't be surprised if Peter was thinking Ezekiel 34 when he wrote this. So we are done with uh, chapter two and uh, I know. That's <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> and we're done, yeah. So, well, well, let me pray first. Dear Father, again, I want to thank
thank you for um, giving us warnings, but also giving us hope, giving us insight, giving us tools by which we can evaluate and learn and study and understand. And um, help us to get deep into your word, deeper and deeper still all the time so that we will know the truth and we'll be able to protect our souls with the green grass of your food for us in our souls that make us strong. And this I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay.